This episode of the podcast is brought to you by City Herbals, S-I-D-D-H-I Herbals.com, the best in CBD technology. It's all happening. It's all happening. It's all happening. It's all happening. Welcome to the podcast, episode 90, It's All Happening with Zach Leary. That is me, your host. That, of course, is the song, Fell on Black Days by Soundgarden. Lead vocal by Chris Cornell, who departed this material world this week. It, it, it's just, it, you know, we, we had to play some song from him and talk about it just a little bit, and, and not much can be said. You can't really make make sense in a digestible human intellectual rational way of how life can end like this when somebody's at the top of their game and is living in this world of artistic creativity that comes across as perfection that reaches so many people in a form of light magic song love anger rage and you know complete just unabashed rocking out um and talent and and uh like i said magic that chris cornell could inhabit at any given time in any one of his projects whether it was sun garden audio slave temple of the dog and for my generation you know i i know i don't remember the exact moment that i heard uh chris cornell's voice for the first time but i do remember the moment to where i heard the song outshined by Soundgarden and I was like wow what is that you know I grew up uh you know on Led Zeppelin and and uh you know the Beatles and Grateful Dead and then there was the song that was you know just as good as any of that and this voice that was just penetrating through my speakers and carried me to that place that only music can take you you know sound vibrational healing is the quickest route to God. And, you know, and I just, I just remember, you know, that moment so, so well. And, and, you know, Soundgarden put out their albums before Nirvana did. So Chris Cornell is really, you know, one of the primary forces in, uh, you know, the, I guess maybe the second or third or fourth revival of rock and roll. Um, his, his talent, um, it's, it's un, un, unspeak, it's unspeakable talent. And it does burden me to, without question, that uh, rock and roll is so marred by tragedy that this medium that is so 
uh, kind of ensconced in bringing light to us and helping us, you know, the listeners, the fans through their daily lives and finding meaning and finding source and finding light and love. But so many of the artists are tortured and live in this darkness and end their lives in very mysterious ways that leave us all reeling. Uh, so Chris Cornell, thank you for all your work. A word from our sponsors. Friends, I want to share something really positive about the times that we are living in. When I was an ambitious adventure seeking teenagers soaked in the sweet sounds of Terracon Station, our entire relationship with the potentials of the medical miracle had arrived and began to smile. We're nothing short but a dream consisting of fresh science and widespread reality. Evidence and common sense were so to show that there were many valid uses for that great and sacred girl that went way beyond just getting high. And the possibility of there being a variety of legal and pure products available at the consumer level for years in a patron way. Fast forward all this time later, and we can joyfully report that the tribe rallied and proved to the country's medical astrology that many aspects of the cannabis plant can now be used for many specific medical applications where you just wouldn't jump around me and can do so without a psychoactive effect. Take out the THC, excellent the CBDs, and combine them with other potent and focused herbs, and you have a nature's medicine plan. And Sage Herbals is at the forefront of this, and their products are some of the best available. Their product lines are crafted from a combination and synthesis of the best active genetic herbals and premium hemp derived extracts. Their powerful and healing tonics are revolutionary and true. And some of the only products available in the market formulated with advanced Ayurvedic and Chinese purple blacks. If you're looking to relax and enjoy us or just soothe your aching bones from all that yoga that you've been doing, City Herbals has a product for you. They're offering this kind of four distinct formulas that target your everyday healthy lifestyle. They are 100 percent non-psychoactive and are available for sale at cityherbals.com. That's S-I-D-D. H I H E R B A I S C Herbals dot com. Head on over there to take a look at the matchbook and collections they have brought up and serving near you. City Herbals is our sponsor. Thank you very much for helping us out on this episode and supporting It's All Happening. So this week on the podcast, episode 90, we have a return visitor to the podcast, return guest, not a visitor. He's a dear friend, Govind Das, who is... You know, truly one of the great yogis operating here uh, in in America, and you know, week in and week out, day in and day out, he is teaching at his little urban temple, Bhakti Yoga Shala, in the heart of downtown Santa Monica, performing his Dharma. And you know, if you think that you teaching yoga is just a profession, you know, and it's something that he does just to feed his children because it works for him. You know, I, I urge you to think again. And if you, after all of these years, if you really get to know Govindas and watch him kind of just live his life in here in Santa Monica and performing service for all of us, it is truly something of wonder. And I look at him all the time and just wish, uh, you know, I could offer just a smidgen of that light and service and love that he brings to humanity every day. You know, he teaches five or six, seven classes a week, sings Kirtan all of the time and uh, brings so much light, harmony, love and magic to to all of the world out there. He's truly extraordinary. So visit Bhakti Yoga Shala in downtown Santa Monica and uh, see what he's up to, take one of his yoga classes. And uh, and I just enjoy this chat with him. He's a good friend. And, you know, we just kind of talked about life and how we could bring the practice of yoga in an integrational state, um, into an integrational mood into our daily lives, kind of taking it off the mat and into the world. So visit Bhakti Yoga Shala and enjoy the podcast. The, 
a um, year ago? Less than a little. I think it was about a year ago. Yeah, it feels like that. Govind Das, welcome to the podcast. Oh, welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is episode 90. You were here episode 48, so about a year ago, yeah. just a little over a year. 52 weeks. 52 is weeks. 52 weeks. It's 52 weeks. It's 52 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Amazing. That's 52 So weeks. every year you can come back. Okay. So I'll be here 142. All right. <laughs> So episode ninety. Thanks for coming, man. Um, it's yeah. So great to be here. <laughs> it's 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 great to have you. So uh, yeah, you know, I mean, because I, you know, I know you and kind of been around your world for a while. It's not like a, I have so many specific questions, but I do want to start off with one thing. And I remember, you know, when we used to go on these walks in Malibu, yeah. you know, a few years ago, right? We do those every Friday, right? Mm-hmm. And you said something that. Uh, you would actually stop to figure out at that point, like you had taught X thousands of yoga classes, yes. right? And you had figured it out. And then, you know, and it really hit me because I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, I guess if you do stop to think about it, you've done these things. And so you're probably at 15,000 or 20,000 yeah, yoga classes. I think somewhere between 15 and 20,000. That, that it's just so amazing. So aside from you know, the material world necessity. It's like we all have to pay our rent and eat, right? How do you how do you stay in this space of being able to do this every day? I mean, how, how is it a practice for you? Is it just your dharma? I mean, how, how do you do it? I think it's both of those things. I think it is a practice and, you know, it, it really, it heals me to, to teach it really does to drop into that space of consciousness, awareness, the heart, um, presence, intentionality. Mm. You know, when when we lead a class, we have to expand our consciousness and increase our awareness and, and become more sensitive. And all of those things for myself are incredibly healing. So I love it. I love it just as much now or even more now than I ever have. Really? And so I walk in and, and you know, in this tradition that we're, we're a part of, this Neem Karoli Baba tradition, serve everyone, serve everyone, serve everyone, serve everyone. So I really use the teaching as, as for me, my a part of my seva, a part of my service, a part of a simple yoga class, but... We know how even just a 90-minute yoga class, how it can make us feel better and walk out the other side a little bit more peaceful and less reactive and more kind and loving. So I really feel that, as you had just mentioned, dharmically that is very much a part of what I'm here to do. And, And through my own practice of service within this little, what could we say, this little... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? A cocoon. Cocoon, yeah. yeah. It's a beautiful, of, a, of a yoga class, that's what... Yeah. Um, that's where I can offer a, a little drop of that, my part to make this world a better place. Yes. Yeah. So, so do you... Um, <clears throat> when you go into a yoga class, um, you, you know, and I know over the course of any given week, there's a ver- variety of yoga classes, you know, maybe... Tuesday night yin is a little bit slower or something, but like, you know, Saturday morning or Sunday morning where it's really crowded, mat to mat or anything like that. Do you have an intention going in or are you just kind of just see what happens? You know, before I start every class, I look at Maharaji's picture hmm. and I just open up to that possibility of being the highest form of service that I can and it always just is, is for me is back to being of service. Mm. But very rarely do I ever come in with a with a certain intention that I want to bring into the class. It's always just okay. more so reading the, the energy of the class. Because every time, it, it seems like any time I've ever tried to do that in the past, people show up. That mm, where I have to completely shift the intention because you know you never know who's going to show up in your class, mm. um, but you know on certain 
themes, Guru Purnima, or certain days or holidays, full moons, new moons, Guru Purnima, Hanuman Jayanti, you know, I'll use those as themes to to share these specific teachings. And kind of shift the energy a little bit that yes. way. So when you, when you talk about reading the room, and that's a really kind of interesting um, tangent to go off because, uh, you know, it, it's very palpable, I think. When you read a room, I mean, I know as a yoga practitioner or a kirtan practitioner or, you know, anything uh, or a kirtan leader, even, you know, the, the, the vibe of the room is, you know, can tell you a lot. Mm. So what do you think people are looking for? Students? Yeah. Students. Always different. Mm. You know, when, and it's really interesting reading the room because half of the room wants to work really hard and the other half <laughs> wants to lay down and do nothing. <laughs> So how do we marry that together? <laughs> how do we bridge that together? And you can tell that by people's body language. Yeah. One, you know, two, mm. the, by the way they speak, the the energy of the room when you walk in or people talking to each other. Half mm. the room's in a social situation and they're all kibitzing with each other. The other half is lying back in a restorative pose. And right. So, right. And sometimes you can just feel a heaviness. Other times you can feel a, a lightness. Uh-huh. And a lot of that, I think, has to do with time of day, but mostly, mostly just the the people that are there and just where they are. Yeah, and but- how do we work with that? And and uh, <clears throat> I remember Brian Kess once saying, "Give them a bit of what they want, and give them a bit of what they need." <laughs> <laughs> So how do you bridge the gap between half the room wanting to oh, work out and do 108 sorry, and almost scars <laughs> in 10 minutes and then the guys who just want to sit in Shavasana? Where, where's the balance there? Well, for me, the, the, the balance <laughs> has always been through giving permission for people to adjust and adapt and mm-hmm. for you know offering possibilities for the people that want to work harder to take extra extra push-ups you know after their vinyasa so you give that space in yes. there to allow for yes. that right I you see. know like right. actually verbally giving those types of cues mm. for people that want to work harder or on the other side of the coin you know for people that don't the child's pose is always there um laying in shavasana is always there as a possibility right. as well too and that's okay and that's okay. Right. Yeah. And and mm. yet that can be quite difficult as well too to keep when people are completely on the opposite sides of the energetic spectrum to keep joining it together. And, and you know, the way I like to teach is to try to find somewhere in the middle a balanced approach where everybody can join in. Yes. Um, for that that sense of, I once heard Vijay Krishna, one of our buddies in Kirtan, he says, maximum participation, <laughs> maximum participation. And I feel that with Kirtan, but as well too in a yoga class. How can we create a format or a structure or a space where uh, everybody can somehow join in and feel like we're all on the same team. We're all in the same boat. We're all in the same bus together. And when that happens, that palpable connection of, of group energy is is transforming it's strong I, yeah and i know one thing that you say in your classes which i <clears throat> i always know kind of it sticks out more than i hear other teachers do it but you say you know you're going through a sequence or something or, uh, or a few sequences and then you'll say okay let's meet in whatever it is you know we'll meet in downward dog we'll meet in child's pose or something that. And I just like that. That's sort of like okay, you, you you're each in a different place, but we'll meet here, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I I like that. You know, what um, but you know you you know you occupy this space. Um, I mean, I think it's changed over the years. You know, before Bhakti Yoga Shala, when you were teaching at Power Yoga, yeah. it was. Mm, a more aggress- aggressive practice. Yeah. Would you well, say? I don't mm. think so. So you know, strong. No? was strong, but okay. I'm not, hopefully not ever aggressive. Oh, okay. A stronger practice. Stronger, huh? maybe, maybe, but I mean, I still teach some yeah. very strong classes as well, too. Okay. And I love that. I love practicing mm. really strong at times, you know, and I also love mm. really gentle, soft practices as well, too. I think the, just the mood is, is always different, time mm. of day, yeah. where we are. And, uh, and however you're feeling. And, yeah, <laughs> and however I 
try to step outside of how I'm feeling. Mm, try to, not always am I good at that, but you know, I try to mm. really make it about the practitioners. So how does, you know, and, and your teacher trainings and, and all of this, I mean, you call your teacher trainings, um, Bhakti yoga teacher training. Yeah. So, you know, I was just kind of saying, you know, you occupy the space where, you know, you, you could have a strong class and people sweat and do get a good physical workout. Yeah. But how is the bhakti infused here? Yeah. And where do these two different worlds meet for you? It's an interesting question because, you know, we haven't really seen that much before yeah. in the history of yoga. Right. At least spoken so much about where bhakti and asana meet together. And right. I, I've found that a fascinating place for my own meditations and, and how I can synthesize and integrate it. You know, I look back to Ramakrishna and he says, the essence of all spiritual discipline is bhakti. You know? And. Krishnamacharya was a bhakta. And Krishnamacharya is a bhakta. Yeah, yeah. I mean, by name alone. A devotee. A devotee. So somehow over the course, I mean, especially when yoga hit the West and got popularized in the West, um, you know, I, I mean, I'm not the most astute, you know, yoga historian, but somehow when it really hit the West, it, you know, immediately fell into this category of, oh my God, it's a great exercise right. class. And it is. No doubt about no that. No doubt. Yeah. I mean, your body looks good. You feel good. You sweat and you can replace going to the gym by doing asana. Yeah. But somehow along the way, I mean, maybe this is just a symptom of the West, you know, the bhakti. It lost its devotional. Lost essence. its devotional. Yeah. And you're adding it back. I'm trying. I'm trying to do my best. You yeah. know, to me, it just makes sense that asanas, they can be used a million different ways, you know, infinite infinite ways an asana can be used one even in in one moment it can be used in different ways you know it can be used as a great workout mm -hmm. one but at the same time it can be uh it can be a body prayer mm. you know that's that's the way i the way i see that asana really can take on its devotional um properties you know when it's used as a, as a body prayer the consciousness the underlying quality of devotion that it's done with and 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 what is that i mean it's really just an inner quality it's an intention it's an inner feeling it's bhav mm -hmm. that's brought into <clears throat> asana and when you feel it as a as a as a prayer as an offering of gratitude, mm -hmm. you know, an asana done as an, an asana practice done as an offering of gratitude, a pure heart gratitude for this, this life, this human life, this body. Mm -hmm. And we know we have to take care of this body, a sacred temple. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we're well, when we're balanced, when we're in harmony, we can then serve and love everybody else more effectively. And, with a greater sense of that heart. So, you know, the, the body prayer thing, I, just, yeah. I, I like that so much. And that, you know, I imagine, you know, there are a lot of, uh, you know, practitioners who come to your class or any yoga class really, but, who you know, come to your class and, you know, they want to know, understand more sort of like what this bhakti infused practice is, but they don't, you know, I mean, traditionally, you know, we may think like you and me or some of our other satsanga friends may think of bhakti and, and the specific, you know, Ram, 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 or Hanuman Chalisa, yeah. or Nim Kurli, or so specific yeah. sort of, you know, entities or methods or something like that. But for people who don't even really know what that is, yeah. you know, like, where do you start? Well, and that's why really... I like the body prayer thing, because that feels yeah. like something everybody, oh, okay, I know what that is. Yeah. Right. You know, bhakti is so interesting because it's it's there's no real form to it, right? It's an inner yes something. It's an inner quality. It's an inner mood. Yes. You know, we talk about the mood so much. I love bhakti, how that right? yes yes. So it's a mood in which asana is done. Uh, okay. You know, when yeah. when we we could call it devotion in motion, asana vinyasa is devotion in motion or a body prayer. It's the mood. It's the inner. Mm 
quality, the bhava, the bhava that, that the asana practice is done with. And I find myself that when it's done with that versus just a physical workout kind of thing, that uh-huh. it becomes so much more rich and so much more loving. And it, the so much less force is done with it. And you can still work hard, but it's not a forceful thing. It right. has a more of a yielding type of a quality to it. It doesn't have that from the, resistance the, the and all that. Yeah. Rigidity and resistance. Yeah. And the movements become more beautiful. You know, we want to make ourselves beautiful for mm. the divine. So, so it, we make our asanas beautiful. And then when I say beautiful, it doesn't mean perfectly straight, but just the, 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 the flowering mm. of it. It's like, a, it's like you become a flower that you're offering at the Lord's feet. Your asana is like a flower itself. Uh, so so the, this mood thing, yes. I, mean, I just love that that, you know, I talk about that all the time and I just love how that's sort of infused into the practice and mm. everything. But the mood, it must be cultivated. Right? So how do you cultivate the mood mm. with your students? How do you introduce them to that concept? Mm. Well, that's a great question. How do I introduce them to the mood? And I think that for me, it's sharing what practices of devotion are all about to give them a certain feeling of, of what is this bhakti? You know, what is this practice? You know, I'll use quotes from teachers mm. like Krishna Das. I just heard this. I've been sharing this a lot lately that Krishna Das at his workshop a couple of weeks ago, he says, devotion is falling in love with that love that is who we are. Falling in love with that love that is who we are. Yes. Okay. <laughs> we are that love. Yes. And the practices of bhakti are about falling in love with that. Now, it's interesting because asana is a real physical thing. Mm. Yet, bhakti is of the heart. So, they're seemingly separate entities on a certain level. But if we can bring that heart into the physical quality of our asanas that's where ah uh, yes that's something subtle it's very subtle it's a very subtle thing it's which yes. is interesting cuz that's not what our western culture is all about right it's not about subtlety so no it's not <laughs> you know i think for me it's the the use of quotes the 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 referring referring to teachings from the great masters that may not necessarily be speaking about asana, but about the essence of bhakti. And then I'm trying to guide that heart-based quality into how we do uh, and, and, our and, asana. And, yeah, I mean, but also like that whole concept of um, falling in love with the love that is who we are. Yes. Like the impl- and Krishna Loss talks about this a lot. Like um, another great Krishna Loss quote is um, the only renunciation that is necessary is the renunciation of hatred towards ourself mm. because mm. Katie has been had a lot of suffering and, yes. you know and as have I um, but that, that that whole thing it's just you know falling in love with exactly where you're at yes. right yes. which I think in the West that's an incredibly difficult thing to bring to people it is yes. and it's the probably the most needed because we've been uh, so ingrained to try to get somewhere. Right. So it's a uh, it's that's I think the the work of us teachers is just to keep planting those seeds that we don't need to chase 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 and make ourselves crazy, but just right. to really embrace where we are and who we are and even what our asanas look like and feel like in uh. a certain moment. You know, back to how do we how do I guide people into the state? And I think it's, it's speaking about things like surrender, Mm. you know, these real essence types of bhakti teachings, you know, the surrendering of what's resisting the love is who we are, right? We have an infinite supply of it. We can't get more of it. It is, it is, it is all right there. The love of the universe is who we are. It's under our personality, body, (laughs) mind, thoughts. Okay. Mm. What is 
resisting that? What is blocking that? Where, where is, what is interfering with that? And then that's the work, right? It's like digging out the weeds. So what is blocking that and interfering with that? Well, I think that's what we were just talking about, trying to get somewhere else. Yeah. Thinking that somewhere else will bring happiness when, you know, that's Everything an illusionary state of mind. Yes. Here it is. Abundance is this moment. You know, I think uh, our fear, our anxiety, our worry, our doubt, our anger, our frustration, our guilt, our shame, our, um, you know, yes. tendencies. These our, are our habits. Our habits. Yeah. yeah. Our um, habits. These are those things that interfere with it. And so that's where, you know, from a certain perspective, oh, the practices of love and devotion. And from a naive perspective, oh, it's all sweet and sugary, you know, <laughs> but it's, a, it's fire. It's, it's, You've got to burn through it. You've got to burn through it and you have to be willing to look at where your demons are. Yes. Oh, man, I know. I mean, that's the, you know, that's also the first step. You know, obviously, in letting go of those demons, yes. being able to look at them in the mirror and going, "Oh shit!" You know, <laughs> That's it. Here, here they are. Um, but you know, we do. You know, we look around the world today, and obviously, I think no matter what side of the fence you're on, politically or spiritually or whatever, you know, economically, you know, obviously, there's a great amount of confusion yeah. out there right now, um, and. The source of it, though, you know, I do find some some irony because, like, in, you know, we had this amazing revolution that was the 1960s, right? And, you know, the mindfulness revolution now is bigger than it's ever been, you know. I mean, there's more people practicing yoga and meditation than ever before. 50 million, I just heard. Somebody at Shakti wow. said 50 million people. Really? Yeah. Wow. So where's the disconnect? What, what, what aren't we getting high? For me, I think, I mean, I want to answer the, the question and maybe you answer it. I think it's uh, integration. I think a lot of people have, um, and this was the problem with the 60s too, there was you know this great cultural revolution that affected people's bodies, minds, souls, spirits, knowledge, intellectual path, all of it, but there was no integration. It was sort of like, oh my God, oh my God, okay, well, you know, I don't know. Then people sort of became yuppies and, you know, and lost it. So they, it's an integration thing. And that's what I think. Where do you, I mean, where, where's the disconnect here? How do we make it all work together? Mm. I'm asking you big lofty questions. <laughs> that's a <laughs> great question. <laughs> well, I think uh, there's so many confusing messages right now mm. that... We have to be really, really willing to to unwind it all within ourselves and break break ourselves open, tear it all down and and I think very few modern day practitioners are really willing to do that. Mm-hmm. Yoga has become a, a feel good thing, like a massage. Oh, okay. You know, yeah. the we have to be willing to unwind our whole being, and and yeah. I just don't know if people are really doing that. Yeah, unless we get initiated through some, you know, major life crises. Right. For me, it happened through my disease in yes. my early twenties, and that's it. Just. Change your life. She broke me down. That was my yeah. initiation, you know. Yeah. Uh, everybody has with yourself something different, you know. And yeah. But when we have those things, they're incredibly difficult, but boy, do they open us up to a greater sense of possibility. And yoga, a 90-minute yoga class is a great, great thing, a 75-minute, an hour thing. But is it unwinding us as much as it as we really need it to, to really tap into the power of our soul. Yeah. So, I mean, you were in your early twenties, you know, you, you had this, this internal kind of a, what, that kind of digestion based disease yeah. and you were kind of left at the, at the precipice. What was the tipping point? Remind me again. I know there was a specific thing that happened, but where you said, Oh shit, I, I'm not going to do that. 
Well, it was, you know, I hit that rock bottom and I saw my old ways of being as really the source of it, the huh. stress, the ego, the ego. Okay. The ego. But you, you, you had bad habits. I mean, were you, I mean, bad you, habits, you ate yeah, badly. I ate badly, but it was bad. more so, you know, it was, it was confusion. It was ignorance. It was, um, my stress. It was mental for me. It was really, it was a mental thing. The stress in my own mind, I really believe coming out yeah. of college, what am I going to do next? Oh uh, yeah. That was for me. I really believe at the root of it. What'd you major in? I majored in business oh. accounting. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny well I, Ira Rose in the accountant I mean I could say that, that could have been another reality for you right a reality my parents would have probably wanted much more <laughs> and instead he opens a donation based yoga studio not even a paid a donation based yoga studio like Ram Das his father did you ever hear that story you can you made when they made all the albums what was the album called that they made back in the um, yeah. 60s? Yeah, I and forget. He, his father <laughs> said, you could sell this for $10 or however much. Or you could sell it for $5. And Ram Dass said, no, I only want to sell it for $1. <laughs> <laughs> what? What? And, and, you know, the great uh, Iron with the Ram Dass story, you know, his greatest work, he made no money from. He didn't make any money from Be Here Now. Yeah. Lama Foundation made it all. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, but... You, you know, a, I think that back to that question, it's okay. such a great question, but you know, I, I think it is happening. I think the world is waking up. I really do believe that. You do? I do okay. believe it. Good. I do believe it, but I just think it's a really slow process. I think, you know, and just what, where it happens. I mean, this morning I was teaching my son's kindergarten class. Yoga. We do okay. it once really? a week. We go every Friday or every other Friday. Very Sometimes cool. when we teach these kids yoga and they and, do it and they do it and they, and uh-huh. we always finish with a few minutes of meditation and they're sitting there and when their eyes are closed and their hands are on their knees and their spine is straight and you can really see that something is happening and, and we finish and there is a quiet, there is a quiet amongst the whole group of 23 kids. That's or, amazing. It's, it's real. And, but we, we have this ego. I mean, isn't that the real issue? It's the ego. It's this ego that is, that is just wants to dominate and control everything. And we just have to keep choosing this, this new way. And, and we just, well, I, I think it's, I think it's this ego, but I also think, um, especially in the West, the material world is, um, you know, the veil of illusion, which, um, you know, is partly the Maya, but, um, it's, it's just so seductive. It's so, so, and we, and yeah. we've been bought into this lie that that's, what's going to make us happy. Yeah. And, and look around in life in Santa Monica. Yeah. The world's perfect. Yeah. What do you mean? There's yeah. nothing wrong. You know what I mean? It's so that it's very, very hard to connect A to Z. If you live in Santa Monica, yeah. what do you, what do you mean? I don't understand. Everything's fine. Whole Foods yeah. is open. It's yeah. a beautiful day outside right now. The beach, you know. 78. At 78. So you just don't really like, you can't connect. It's just the, the veil of illusion is yeah. so strong. Yeah. But I, I really, the modern pop culture, mm. the Difficult. seductiveness of nice things and more money yeah. and uh, the attachment to nicer them. body and better food or bigger bank account, nicer car, bigger home. It mm. is so strong. And to not buy into that takes some really deep, deep inner work. Mm, sure does. Yeah. And, and hu- a huge amount of restraint. I've been thinking about this so much lately and sharing with this a lot in a lot of my classes that, you know, we think yo- so much of yoga is expansion but just as much of expansion, it's restraint. Hmm. It's restraint of our own thoughts, restraining old tendencies. Oh my God. Just keep running off. They keep controlling our life. And, and we find ourselves in the same old predicaments of relationships that don't work. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, how un, how unhealthy habits of eating and overweight and yada, yada, you know, whatever story, it is, yeah, whatever it is, tox, yeah. toxic life, essentially, because television, 
governs so much of the conditioning on this planet that we've bought into and mm-hmm. and so much of that is bullshit you know it's yeah. just so we we and i've been thinking about this myself like lately like when do when did i start to take this new course in my life this new flow this new start thinking for myself and I was thinking about this the other day when I started skateboarding when I was like 13 years old back in Maryland on the East Coast. And something about that, I just, that movement or that feeling of flow or, or um, bad, that sense of balance, it was like right around that time I started this new way of thinking within myself and my own life, a little bit more connected to an artistic way of living. Like Uh instead of just doing it the way everybody's always done it, living your life as a canvas and creating Uh your life or co-creating in new types of ways, instead of just doing it the way everybody else has done it and the way we've done it in the past or our parents told us to do it or or what it it may have been. So So, so you're raising two kids. Here in Los Angeles, I mean, I know, you know, you are, uh, you know, you're a yogi through and through. You don't just teach it, you live it. But, you know, we're all susceptible to input. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's unavoidable. Yeah. So how, what are you seeing with your kids? What do you watch out for? How do you, how are you kind of trying to steer them into this, this consciousness here? Yeah. Because they go to school there and other yeah. kids who are not in this yeah, consciousness. It's true. Yeah. It's true. And it's been, that's been really me and my wife's main work, you know, when we have kids is not to dump our shit on them. So they have to spend a life unwinding it, yeah. you know, <laughs> that's right. I know. so they can, they can be more free as they get to places in their life when they can make their own decisions. But, I think a big part of it is the language with them, the language that we we use hmm. is simply just the presence, you know, the presence of really being with them, hmm. you know, and and I'm not saying a high lofty kind of language, but a la- the language of love, the hmm. language of love and and patience and and Again, this this word ego, mm. you know, really just trying to restrain those tendencies of egoic living mm. and live more from the heart. Mm. And kids need boundaries, though. They do. They Otherwise, need boundaries. They don't have any they, sense of they, boundaries. They, right. They, ha- mm. they must have boundaries. And that's the interesting thing is because when you put up boundaries, they start hysterically crying and they think <laughs> that that's you being a mean parent. Right. And so I keep coming back to, you're not, you probably won't understand this right now, but my role is to love you and guide you and protect you. And based on what I see, these are the decisions that I have to make right now. You know, and <laughs> most of the time they don't get it on a conscious level, but I really do think somewhere deep down they are, they are getting it. And I see through their behavior as well too, that it, my son's six and a half, almost seven, six and three quarters, that something seems a little different, you know, something. He's, he's almost seven. He's, yeah. He's starting, already he's, he's getting this thing. And, and you know, I, I've never forced any yoga or meditation, but in the last six months, I've just, just cool. Like, Hey, meditate with me. Uh. And usually before bed, so he can stay up an extra 20 minutes. They'll do anything to stay up an extra 20 minutes. Sure, you know? right. <laughs> and I uh, give him his beads. I tell him to repeat Ram and put the, and we start together and each bead with each breath and repeat the mantra Ram with it. And he really likes it. He likes it. You know, the kids, they, they actually like this. There's always a kid, a few kids before we start, okay, before teaching his yoga class, okay, we're going to do yoga now. And most of the kids are like, yay. And there's always a few kids, no. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. <laughs> and I saw, uh, I, so, somewhere, I saw Malachi, uh, Drumming or something? Or by playing cartels? Cartels. Yeah, cartels. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so he's banging, in it. Banging him a little. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think we just, we're just doing what we're doing. Yeah. 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 Y
do our best to, to live in that presence of love. And they get that and they feel that. And, you know, they, they have all of their mm-hmm. tendencies that could be coming from past lives as well, too. And, sure. And to try to offer a deeper understanding of why not to do things instead of no. Mm-hmm. Instead of everything, no, 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 don't do that. But to, to try to give them some insight and understanding as to why we want to behave in certain ways. Yeah, that's... Uh... Yeah, it's it's it's, it's fast, and I'm glad that you feel because it, that um, the world is coming to an awakening. Yeah. Because I think that is a necessary belief in order for there to be progress. I think you have to believe that there is progress. Yeah. I, you you can't. Uh, uh, I mean, as as you know, uh, temporarily cynical as I can get, yeah. you can't stay in that space because right. that doesn't offer any solution. Right? You know, if it's just doom and gloom. Everything is fucked. Oh my god! Yeah. You know, it's just. I, I don't believe that. Um, and here's another interesting thing we, uh, about two months ago was this day called International Yoga Day. So they invited oh, yeah, us yeah. to, I'm sorry, International Kids Yoga Day, oh. which is different than International Yoga Day. And this woman from the Palisades set it up and they're doing it in 41 countries and we got involved and we taught the whole school where my son goes through and mm. 600 kids. And at the beginning I asked, how many kids have done yoga before? 90% of the kids wow. all raised their hand and said yes. That's amazing. <laughs> 90, where I grew up in Rockville, Maryland, if they would ask my whole elementary school, probably 0% actually. Yeah. I could probably say maybe not one kid had ever done yoga at that age. So yeah. hopefully... You know, the, 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 the amount of people, the 50 million people that are doing yoga, a good portion of those people are parents, helps us to, you know, make more conscious choices in our life and in our parenting and it affects them and yeah. that's what, how it grows. What, when we were doing that, um, at the Dying to Know film and kind of, you know, doing these talks all around the country on it and stuff, someone brought to me... Um, just kind of in reference to the importance of Ram Dass and how, like, we don't understand now, but when he came back from India in 1969, um, when he went in 1967, when he first came back the first time, nobody was doing that. You know, nobody was changing their name to, you know, I mean, to, I mean, your Govindas and, you know, and Narayan, all of our friends, nobody was doing that shit, you know, and it was radical. And, in 1963, there were only like three places to practice asana in the whole entire of America. Wow. Yeah, like it just it just didn't exist. Yeah. So how new this is still? It's you know, still 50 new. years is not long. Yes. You know, I mean, Ron Bus is still alive. You know, how new it all still is. So it's just, you know, I get, you know, I spiral out of control with some impatience and stuff, and we just have to remember that. Oh my gosh, you're right takes a couple generations you're yeah. passing it on to your kids right you know they'll grow up with it as part yeah. of daily life yeah they can pass it on to theirs and yeah. you know it just and it does feel like we're at a real the the the, the struggle between the sides now is, we're at is, a crossroads. Is, is a really everything is is at a real heightened sense oh no doubt yeah and maybe a tipping point who really knows, you know, but something's going to happen. Yeah. Here. Something's yeah. going to happen. I, I think everyone can agree again, no matter what side of the fence you're on, this is not sustainable. Yeah. You know, that there's no way we can keep going like this. Yeah. So what's it going to be? You know, I mean, I choose to think, I mean, or just in the political example, we have to remember that Bernie Sanders, I've said this a zillion times on my podcast. I'm sorry, listeners. I always say it, but Bernie Sanders could have won. You know, he was at the, the grown-ups table. Yeah. It wasn't a crazy fringe weird idea. I mean, it was somewhat possible. Yes. You know, so that's just a political example. But, you know, I mean, whatever it's going to take, that 50 million people can grow to 70 million people yes. doing yoga. And I really believe it will because yoga mm. works, you know. And, mm. and with, with, with stressful times, we need... And, you know, for like myself... So commonly, health concerns wake people up. Yeah, but it's so, man, you know, the, this is a, a tremendous, uh, I, I struggle with this a lot because I don't want people 
I mean, you had a preemptive strike. You yeah. were very young, yeah. you know, so you were young enough to where it didn't have to ruin your life and you could shift, you could pivot and you would like, you know, I know a doctor offered you, hey, take this pill for the rest of your yeah. life. And you said, fuck that. But you were young. I don't want people to have to get to the point of something going wrong, right. you know, to wake up. Right. You know, that's, you know, there, you can do. And I don't think they are. I mean, okay. the, 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 the amount of younger kids, the 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 year old kids that are really into this stuff now, it's, it's so cool to see that. And they aren't having to go through a dark night of the soul to get it. It's just become so a part of mainstream awareness and consciousness that it's happening. Maybe because their parents meditate or their parents do yoga, they move in that direction as well too. So yeah, but talking about all, all of this, it brings me back to the integration thing because like, so what happens when you leave the studio? How do you take this practice out of off your mat? Yeah. You know, so that organization, what's it called? Off the mat into the world, yeah. whatever it's called. You know, how do you take it off the mat well, into the world? That's a great, what I yeah. like to say is commonly at the end of class, what do we all bring our hands to the prayer position and yeah. what do we do? We say namaste. Mm -hmm. And we've, in our modern day yoga world, we've all agreed that that namaste is the closing of the practice, right? right? right. Well, we have to flip our awareness <clears throat> and actually think that when we say namaste at the quote unquote end of class, that that's actually the beginning of our yoga practice. <laughs> We walk out the doors and that's the real yoga practice. So the actual class is just like a primer. That's the hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's, but it is, you know, I mean the, 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 the yoga of life, that's where it's at, you know, how we live our lives, how we relate to each other. How we behave out in the world. How we behave, how we behave, you know, in our worldly lives. And, yeah. and that's how I imagine the world really changes when we, we all start to live with more awareness and consciousness and behave with more loving kindness, mindfulness. It's an amazing thing because I'm even, uh, <laughs> you know, like, you know, this was the classic L.A. example, but driving, you know, <laughs> when you're when you're driving down the, you know, the freeway and something happens and you just have that moment where it all goes out the <laughs> goddamn window <laughs> and you're like, oh, my God, what happened? <laughs> I was singing Hanuman Chalice just half an hour ago, <laughs> you know, it's like, what happened? You know, so it's hard to remember. Yeah, right. It is. And that's that restraint thing those old tendencies start mm -hmm. to flush back in really quick. So we have to restrain those tendencies, mm. which takes mind control. It takes focus, all of the things that we're cultivating when we do practices and restrain those old tendencies. And, and these new neural pathways start to open up that we can dig the more we follow them and make uh. these new choices. These grooves become deeper and then they become easier for our, us to follow and that's really how we transform ourselves it's a real reprogramming yeah it's a repro it's a great great word well you, where you use the word you know these neural transmitters yeah. really new ones start to form yeah right and you know and that in turn does create a behavior change yeah like down the road. Yeah. It just takes a while. Once the grooves are deep enough that you actually can start sliding into them. And, and this is why we do daily practice, this right? Is, this is why we do daily practice. Right. Deep in those grooves. Mm. Yeah. New grooves. At the, um, and you know, a lot of people, I mean, uh, we look at things like ayahuasca and, and, sure. and these things that help us to psychedelics on any, any level, you know, they help us to see. Yes. These old pierce tendencies. The veil. Pierce the veil. See that these old Amen. tendencies and are just, you know, not really the most optimal way to live. We have enough space that we can step back, detach ourselves. Mm. And then when you get that, you say, well, okay, well, what is the new, what is the, the right way to live? And you can begin to follow a new conscious, intentional way of stepping forward. It, it's life. It, it, uh, um, in the introduction to um, Ekanatha Schwarin's translation of, of the Gita, mm -hmm. something like, um, you know, the primary 
um, if you can sum up all of Krishna's teachings in one primary word, the word is renunciation. Yeah. Uh, and that doesn't mean renunciation like becoming a brahmachari yeah. and, you know, doing all putting of that. Putting on orange clothes. Putting on orange clothes, right. shaving your head and just living like a monk. It means renunciation of, of like you're talking about restraint. It could yeah. also be, yeah. you could say it's restraint as well. And just looking at all of your Renouncing actions. the ego, right? Renouncing the ego. Is that what he said? Yes. Renouncing the ego and kind of creating a, a method for you to observe your observe your thoughts and your actions, yeah. right? And yeah. in each one, where does each one fit? Is it sattvic? Is it tamasic? Is it yeah. where are you coming from? Yeah. yeah. But the but the ego, I mean, I mean, you you've been you've said it a few times that you know living in this place of ego, but you know it still has. Um, you know, there's still a necessary place for it to, I mean, I'm just, I'm, there's a necessary place for it to exist in the sense that, you know, you still have to be Govindas. Of course. You need to be different course. than Zach. And, of course. Right? Well, I think that's that's a healthy ego. A healthy it, ego, right. Because we all need, uh, the way I, th- I see a healthy ego is that we all need that sense of individuality and, and of yes. that we are and on one level separate identities we have personalities yeah 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 you have separate personalities yeah. yes i mean and, that, and that's a great thing yeah you know and i and like you but we're we're all one we're all in this together are, yeah. but we could contribute in different ways so but that where, where i was going with it and in, in the 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 ego thing the healthy sort of ego and um back to dharma realizing one's dharma you know, to me, that's um, uh, the more I think about it, the more I'm just sort of in this practice and look at the world around us. I'm feeling like that is more and more like the necessary ingredient in that most people, and I could speak for myself 100%, you know, spend many years lost. Don't feel it as much anymore, but many, many years lost, not knowing what I should be doing. Yeah. You know, and if you can find just a little sort of and it can change, of course, over time, but just a little sense of purpose, mm. right? Yeah, I think when when I mm. first got sick, mm. I had no sense of purpose or direction in my life. And, right. and that was one of the reasons that I got sick, because I had no Oh, it direction. manifested. I believe so. Uh, and well, how did it manifest like that? Why do you think it manifested in that way, though? Well, because I was just floating without any ground. No, but why in the specific, like the intestinal? Well, stuff? I mean, you th- is there a reason for that? Yeah, I mean, and- my personal thoughts are around that. And really, intuition, you know, is is that for me it was it was mostly about elimination root chakra and I had no sense Mm. of ground in my life and stability in my life and no direction in my life. And that's why my sense of elimination just literally went. Wow. Because (laughs) yeah. And that's, and that's these beautiful maps that we get from the Eastern traditions that Mm. we can start to look at the chakras and we can look at our own imbalances and then start to, piece them all together through, you know, and within our psyche and, and behaviors and where we are in our life and what's going on and, and look at our imbalances and start to get maybe some inklings on, on why things are going out of balance. And then we can start to put things into place. And then when, and what's really interesting is when I started to find my Dharma and, and devoting myself to teachings, which came out of being sick. So it was really a blessing in disguise. I started to get well again. Oh, yeah. That's fascinating. Just by when a shift in to consciousness. Have some, some root, right? Wow. Just by a shift in consciousness. Just by a shift in consciousness. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That, that's, I, I mean, that says a lot, I yeah. think. Right. I mean, now you can look around, uh, I mean, specifically on this topic, man. I mean, you. But can, we don't even, most of us, we don't even give ourselves the, the time to do that because we are so afraid of not feeling well that we, you know, need to take the quick. 
yes. pill to get ourselves better. I mean, that's the society but, that we live in. Yes, we live in a society too, but the, also we live in a society that I feel kind of promotes that you have to have something wrong with you, mm-hmm. which is a very <laughs> twisted place <laughs> to be. Uh, You've got to have something wrong with yeah. you. You've got to have issues. You've yeah. got to take some kind of pill yeah. because there's something. There has to be wrong. some drama. has yeah. to be some drama going on, right? Or life isn't fun. <laughs> Or, but, or there's no product to buy. Man. Right. You got to, you know, you got to sign up somewhere because there's, you know, and that's like, yeah. I mean, you were talking about television earlier, and you know, as much as I love specific shows on TV, yes. and I do, and I, I'm watch many of them, but I, specific shows, I don't channel surf. Um, you know, this uh, kind of this purveying of this culture of fear. Yeah. You know, we live in this political arena of fear. Yeah. Cultivating this thing of fear. And you know, something that I've been thinking about as well lately is just how bombarded our consciousnesses are by just an unlimited amount of messages that we're getting, you know, the moment we open up our computer screen to turn on the car radio or or our our phone. I mean, it's just, we just don't have time in the day to even deal with all of this stuff anymore and and from that we all feel like we're we're behind and unless we are lucky enough to have an assistant or two in our lives which i don't i don't know about you but um i have a virtual assistant virtual, which is pretty cool great highly recommend it for great yeah. how do you do that it's uh yeah, there's uh, two services you sign up for yeah. um yeah one is uh yeah you just sign up online and one is just over text message and email and it's just a virtual assistant and they help you get they, all they're, your work they're done. synced up to my calendars and my great. contacts and you just send them a text and they handle it great it's awesome <laughs> it's great highly worth it 35 bucks an hour Ooh. <laughs> nice um yeah but it just seems like we we are at this this time where everything is so full and and feeling like it's going to burst like a bubble that's about to burst you know yeah yeah it's 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 a fascinating a fascinating time to be alive i'm curious to see i'm curious to see where we go so what do you i mean we start off this conversation you know and i I asked you about, you know, you've taught however many thousands of yoga classes now. Do you think about what's next for you or do you just show up every day? And I mean, I, mean, I well, do, I do. I think about that. I think about that. You know, I really, um, I love very deeply what my life looks like right now, which mm-hmm. is just living in service. You know, I mean, this is, as Gandhi said, the, the greatest way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. Okay. Right? And somehow that's where my life has been led to. And then even, you know, I sit down in front of the harmonium, I feel like service, an act of service. Teach a yoga class, service. I'm with my kids, service, love, service, devotion. So it's all become very... Uh, one pointed, you know, everything, even mm. r- in relation to Bhakti Yoga Shal, it's, it's, it feels like it's service based in the sense of creating a temple for people to come to where they can restore, renew, heal. And that's what it is. It's yeah. an urban temple. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, expansion, I f- I'm feeling just a sense of expansion somehow, some way. I would love to start doing some bigger tours, you know, personally, whether it's um, kirtan tours or mixing that with some yoga, uh, whether that's bigger North American tours, you know, things have been, I haven't been able to do that with with two little kids around, but as the kids start growing up uh, and getting a little older, especially my two-year-old as she gets, the first two years are very labor-intensive, hands-on time. It's been so beautiful. She's so cute. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And, you know, I've been thinking about open up more bhakti yoga shalas. I don't really have the, the how okay. that's going to happen yet, but I said, man, that would be really cool. Uh, you know, that would be, that would be something that might be a next step. Okay. You know, maybe some international. I was thinking about my wife lives in Australia. I mean, it's from Australia. We've never done an Australian tour. We were just talking about that a couple of nights ago. How cool would that be to uh, go travel Australia and sing Kirtan? They love Kirtan in Australia now. Yeah, they do. Um, yeah. So these types of things, but, you know, I try not to get too lost on it because this world that we live in, everybody's doing so much. You look at Instagram and everybody's doing so much, you know. Yeah, I know, right? It's like, 
everybody Gosh, you can just... make us crazy. <laughs> so I just have always tried to keep my life really simple. Yeah. So I could maintain some joy and not get totally stressed out and lost in it all. Everybody's just always... It's so busy. Everybody's busy. <laughs> Everybody's busy and creating busyness for themselves. But it's funny, like in the, um, you know, the traditional... Um, like a uh, definition of a sadhu and how like a sadhu and a sannyasi is sort of like plans their whole life in terms of the chronology. It comes last. Yes. You know, you have, you have to do your stuff. You, first. you do your householder stuff yeah. first and raise kids work and provide, you know, all of, all of that. And then you go off and you renounce later, yeah. which yeah. I, I just think it's like, we were talking about Trila Rabuvad, Bhaktivedanta before we rolled tape and, you know, he had a wife and kids and a pharmacy in Calcutta, and he was a very worldly man. Yeah. And then he dropped out yeah. and started serving. Yeah. <laughs> so, you and know. it makes sense. Yeah, it's you a, know, it's that, a fascinating. That flow, it makes sense. So, anyways, have you watched this this TV show called The Get Down Brothers? No. Have you heard about it? No. Oh, you got to check it out. What's, I don't know. What Netflix. It is. It's about really the beginnings of the the... The time went between disco and hip hop. Like oh, okay. The, it, the time between it, it's so cool. I know you love TV shows. It's okay. A, this is the second season they just finished. The time between disco and hip hop. Okay, I'll check yeah, it out. In New York City. Oh, man. Oh, it's just the coolest show. Honestly, my favorite show I've ever watched. Oh, wow. Yeah. So cool. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that a was a love affair in there. It's great music. Great, great music. That was a golden age of yeah. music, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah, man. And you see where it all comes from, this modern hip hop uh, hip hop culture. It all has its roots back there. Yeah. And speaking of music, I mean, you know, the, the intro for this podcast is... Uh, uh, before we saw you, it was dedicated to to Chris Cornell, who mm-hmm. you know, sadly, mm. just. Uh, I mean, it's it, it's amazing. I mean, all this, oh. it's so crazy and heavy, and just but you know, all this time, and you know, later, you just uh, you know, he was uh, from my generation. Yeah, you know, one of the great voices. No, like in college, I, I first heard this band Soundgarden, and I was just like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, wow, what is this? Wow. Yeah, so. Godspeed, Chris Cornell. Mm. Um, but Govindas teaches at Bhakti Yoga Shala all the time. Go there, Monday Night Kirtan as well. Retreat coming up in Costa Rica. Yeah. When's that? That's in July, July oh. 8th through okay. 15th. So sign up for that. Yoga Surf Retreat. Wow. Yoga and Surf. <laughs> That's Not cool. at the same time. But. <laughs> Not yet, anyway. Right. Um, cool. All right. Yeah. Great to hang. Thanks, Tino. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the podcast this week. Uh, we'll be back next week with another episode. And uh, I forgot to say at the beginning of the episode, I apologize for a week's absence, but life happens. Thanks.